Okay. Now. RJ, hold on a second. Hold on, RJ. We're getting... They're saying there's no sound for you, but there's sound for me, which doesn't make sense because I was muted. Yeah, and I was I was muted, and I could hear you. Can everyone hear us? No, no. Uh, give it one second. Uh, I hear you, Mike, but no sound from RJ. No sound from RJ. Why would that be? That doesn't even make sense. That doesn't... Possibly, but there should... There's no reason why there should be no sound from RJ. Oh, here, I'll send you the new one. Still no sound from RJ. Okay, let me open up side chat right here. And... There you are. Oh, very weird. That's right. I that's right. I can't. Well, they can't hear you because I couldn't hear you through the stream. Um. This also says desktop, no audio, why? Why are we getting no sound from RJ? Possibly, it's like, it's on my OBS, um... I don't know. It's not picking you up through OBS. Maybe try going out and coming back in, I guess. Why does it say no desktop audio? Okay, I can still hear you. It says there's no desktop audio on OBS. Does anyone know how to fix that? That doesn't make any sense at all. Because there's like always, it always acts like there's some sound in the background, but now it's just acting like there's no sound.
Try cycling your audio captures to some specific input and back to default. What is this? Device, it says default. Okay, speakers. Hello, hello, hello. Properties. Back to default. Okay. Hello. There you are. Ha! Ah. Oh. Oh, I'm back. Thank you, Diana. We love you. Okay. All right. They should be able to hear you now. Oh, okay. Yay! Boy, this is weird. I hate... You can see why... Uh, 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 I come from that era back when there were like two dials on the television set and rabbit ears and all telephones were landlines and sometimes party numbers. So this world is still strange to me. <laughs> everybody everybody can hear RJ, right? Oh, right, chat? Yipes. Okay. Well, this has been a fun Got him. Okay. Oh, all right, RJ, week. back to what you were saying. <laughs> or start yeah, from the beginning, were, I guess. <laughs> we we did have crap all the times like this. Occasionally, even in the old system, once in a while, there'd be roboting and all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I am always amazed that it works at all, uh, that people all over the planet are able to watch me simultaneously. But anyway, back to things. KBF tough. Tough. Chase. Yes. Uh, the uh, the whole point uh, had to do with their dating problems and the creationists all stirring up trouble. This is a common thread of anti-evolutionism, which, of course, Jackson knows firsthand uh, as we've been going through all of these creationist answers books. They just like nitpicking little tiny snippets that, uh-oh, this is a gotcha moment. Ooh, we've got the, the evolutionist on the ropes on this one. Oh, yeah. Well, there's still the data to be accounted for, and you need to explain the data. So... It happens to be that the elephants in the Kubifora aren't modern elephants, not even close. They are a whole bunch of species of previous elephas genus, not even the same genus as the ones that exist today. And so I put a link up to Nancy Todd's paper on that about a uh, reanalysis of African Elifus recchi implications for time, space, and taxonomy, where, she, uh, where she, uh, she's arguing, in fact, that there's actually quite a few species involved in this systematic analysis and all of that. Guess how much of that, of course, was discussed by uh, Rupi and Sanford. I'm going to take a guess that it rhymes with Nero. Yeah, 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 exactly. So we've got all of this stuff uh, I put up. Uh, a variety of uh, other little linkages to what I could. An awful lot of the papers are so bloody old, you can't even find a damned abstract for them at nature. Uh, that it, It's that sparse for some of these things. So I try to put linkages up to stuff that you could get linkages to uh, that kind of brings things up to date, follow-up work. Uh, it's revealing, again, that this will come as a terrible shock to you, Jackson, that uh, uh, Rupi would be citing an old 1972 paper and not the follow-up by the same author in the 1990s. <laughs> in a, I was dealing with the same Menton or related stuff today. Yeah, so. yeah. It, it's just plain, well, it's, it's beyond lazy. It's also uh, manipulative because the whole point of what they're trying to do is to play fast and loose with the data field. And uh, that's gonna get into spades uh, when we get to the exciting world of the Mazinian salinity crisis because that's that on, on uh, mega dosage. But uh, the structure of the thing uh, for Rupi's book I've been continuing to update uh, the bibliography and uh, a source analysis listing, and it's staying very constant. They're averaging 1.7 sources per page, which is really low. Uh, they've got about half of their uh, citations are to regular technical literature, of which a little over half of what they've of which they've misrepresented the contents, like the stuff that I've just been alluding to. So it's a really bad operation, and. Uh, they're at like about 400 some odd sources, which is not massive. Uh, when, uh, the evolution slam dunk, I, I had 2,300 in there and I, I, I'm shuddering to think of when I do the actual total analysis for rocks for there as to how many we've got in that one. <laughs> It'll be a few, yeah, certainly. It's gonna be a biggie. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Brian Stevens says, wait, what, 1973 wasn't the end of when we learned stuff? Who knew? Uh, some creationists don't even manage to make it to 1973, but it, uh, that this brings up the whole source methods approach to how you evaluate stuff. Don't be wild when people put source citations up. Don't be wild when I put source. Well, you should be wild when I put source citations up, but nevertheless, um, uh, because I'm fair and rigorous, hopefully and you all agree with that. That's why I want you to read the stuff too. But the thing is, is when you're looking at an argument in a book from 2017 and they're thrashing over stuff from 40 years ago, uh, you kind of wonder why they're not 
incorporating newer material. And then always the big hide the ball bit is what's their explanation for the data? The data doesn't change, it doesn't go away. Every single fragment of, of information about what crystals are in what rock formations and what uh, uh, kinds of volcanic tuff there are and what kinds of, of pigs and elephants and human fossils. By that way, it was another thing that was really annoying with Ruby and Sanford is their continual implication that if something is in the homo genus, it's automatically us. When in fact, no, if you look at the skulls and the stuff, some of these things in fact are disputed as to whether they're in the Homo genus or Australopithecines or they're very basal Homo uh, erectus or earlier in the Homo habilis. And that was the thing, it's, it's just gobsmackingly wrong to imply that they were finding modern human artifacts, actual Homo sapien bones in these kinds of contexts when they don't. And you can read the papers and find out about it yourself. So it's, it's particularly persnickety that when they're playing it, it's the three card Monty of creationism, except they forget to bring the cards and they forget to bring the peas. So they're just they're just trying to, to mime a three card Monty for you in the hopes that you don't notice the fact that they haven't really made case. David me, Minton did the same thing in what I was reading recently because he's talking about the evolution of the eye. And uh, it's kind of interesting that we, yeah, there's you'll be able to dump all of the the info on eye stuff into this section, it's kind of interesting. We haven't yet come across it. Um, took a while. But Minton was citing a textbook from, drumroll, 1958. Dang. <laughs> it's like, Holy wow. Holy let's really get up to speed on that. Well, you <laughs> have to admit, it's more recent than uh, Stettelheim's or whatever, his one from 1893 uh, that he was riffing off of before. Uh, but the thing is, yeah, that, that's another point of when you look at extremely dated material. Um, uh, let me, let me uh, put up, uh, or, well, I can't put it up, but uh, let me uh, uh, do my little a brief um, uh, can rattle for the project and the thanking of all the Patreons. Uh, I've kept that little file open. Uh, it's a little bit before the half hour, but we've been bumping around in here and who knows whether anything is going to collapse. Uh, I was in the, uh, oh, at Vista, uh, it, uh, you were in the other room and RJ said how many citations per page? Yeah, it's 1.7 uh, per page, which is way below, uh, I've got like um, 2,300 sources in about a 400 page text, so you can do the math there. It's uh, about uh, six per page on average, and that's um, substantially higher uh, than theirs. Uh, it's going to be very, very dense in terms of the new work as well, but anyway. Um, I want to thank all of our patrons. I would normally be putting up our little screen, but we're, we're still in training wheel mode here. Uh, our colleagues, Hendrel and Eric and Suris, our researchers, Travis and Convert Me and Eat Meal and Ralph and Pelogia, hi Pelogia, and Benjamin Simpson and Ugly German Truths, and our assistant researchers, Mike Apple and Garanku and James Fitzwater and Totes Real, and our friends, Daniel and Steve Bauman and uh, Mary Gail Beddoes and Insects Are Cool and uh, Nielsen and Puffalophagus and Bo Hobo and Staggles and Alex and Paul and also legacy patrons, uh, uh, Jan and Jody and John and Keith and Andrew and Geyer and Yui and Mona and Brad and Daniel and Yanya and Sun uh, Sky Stone and Everett and Sewer and Zeshi, people who were able to help out at various times. I wanna thank everybody who has helped out. Um, uh, I'm a social security person on very limited income who has taken on the slight task of obliterating creationism in every possible respect and, and elevating things up to a level of rigor and scholarship and interconnection that I think we can do, but hasn't been done at the level that I want to do it. Um, uh, Jackson, because we're co-writing a book, can literally see how my brain works and I can see how his brain works because we're co-authoring and working over each other's chapters and we can see the kinds of things i always marvel at the subject matter that, that jackson brings into this thing i go oh I, I wouldn't have thought of that of course oh that's neat and then i come back with my own particular perspective on that and the idea being that what we're ending up with is really formidable <laughs> i think there's gonna be an awful lot of creationists that are not gonna like rocks it's not just the science, it's the history of the science and the history of the screw-ups of the creationists. Yeah. So they are faced with their own history, which they sweep under the rug on a near constant oh, basis as their own um, lines shift. I'm, I'm one of these. Uh, uh, my sister once when she was, 
uh, I, I loaned her a copy of one of Philip Johnson's books and she just went Bleh, after she was reading a little bit into it. And she was saying, how do you manage to go through this dreck book after book after book, page after page? And I go, it's my thing. And, and because you can get measurements of behavior based upon a multiplicity of data points. And if all you're doing is looking at a, a particular blip where you get onto a website and creationist says stupid, like duh, and it's an isolated phenomenon, when you know where they're getting the, the stupid from, when you realize they're copying stuff that's been debunked decades ago and we're too lazy to look, Kent Hoban falls into that category, or they're, they're simply trawling material the way, uh, oh, um, uh, who was the little fellow recently that was just trawling uh, Steve Meyer? all the time. Uh, oh, long story short. Long story short, yeah. These people with acronyms instead of names. I mean, good gravy. Uh, I have the advantage because I'm an old retired fart that I, I'm under my own name. I'm not, I, I have my own mug up. I'm not with an avatar. Uh, I have a real live contact information that's me. Uh, and I, I, I'm proceeding accordingly. Other people I can understand might be reluctant because they have families and the like, they don't want to be outed uh, as uh, um, either the creationist or as the atheist, depending upon the framework that you're looking in. But nevertheless, I'm plowing ahead with it. The thing is, I'm banging the damn source methods drop. This is something which uh, I mutated into over time. If you read the old Troubles in Paradise stuff, and if you don't have that on your files that you've downloaded, why not? <laughs> That's what it's there for. That uh, it's admittedly in a much older format because I was still using footnotes and all that kind of stuff. And I never did do an, an index for the book because it was still planned to be a book published by a regular publisher. Then they do the indexes for me. Uh, I actually am much happier going the route that I have been because that means I can control all of the aspects of it. And that means we can put in the indexing exactly as we want and our referencing structure exactly the way we want and all this material exactly as we want and plow ahead with all of that. And we also can take the stands that we want to take and we're not beholden to any external uh, authority on how we do that. But the idea being that you got to remember there are three multiple layers. I was, uh, 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 for those of you who may have caught Aaron Ra's de uh, debate discussion with Faz Rana on this biology prove God and news bulletin, they didn't settle any issues here. <laughs> uh, and in many respects, I was, it did pretty much what I expected it to. Faz Al Rana trotted out origins are bust which is kind of a misnomer because it was about biology and, and origins or bust is about a biogenesis, which isn't part of regular biology. And so it's threw everybody off. Oddly, Aaron Ra and, and uh, Fazal Rana got along really well. They were pleasant with each other. Aaron Ra was delighted at how nicely he was treated. Everybody was just sweet, sweet cakes and, and all that. They were critical of each other. But the problem is, is you're getting a lot of philosophy talk and then occasionally trickling down, ricocheting off of the data floor just a little bit and I'm down there looking at source methods. How do you construct your argument? What are you relying on? Where, what, what data field is he doing? And it was revealing that at one point when um, um, uh, Aaron was trying to kind of bring in the, uh, the phylogeny challenge that uh, Fazal said, well, I haven't really thought through that. And I'm going, duh, <laughs> what? All creationists and intelligent designers don't do systematics at all, what? zip. Zero. No should, example that I know of. You should be theoretically okay with it, though, right? Well, you'd think so. Well, in fact, no, not only that, um, an old earth creationist or intelligent designer ought to have to take a stand on, is anything related to anything? If it isn't, then how did it get here? If you think that human beings are specially created, then go ahead with it. If you think they're evolving from God tweaking nucleotides in an Australopithecine, go ahead and tell us what you think happened and apply that to all, because the data field is still out there. But the fact that I don't know of a single example of any intelligent designer or old earth creationist ever doing systematics within their own frame. If anybody out there in video land knows of a counterexample, please let me know. Uh, um, uh, send it to me, put a little comment in the, in the video or whatever. I don't know of any. Literally, the only systematics is the dun 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 baromenology that's done by who boogie boogie boogie. We're getting close to Halloween. 
um, the, the, that it make, just imagine if the Adams family were doing systematics, that's kind of what you get with. <laughs> well, I've always wanted to know what cousin it is. So yeah, yeah. Well, there he is. He's a, he's a hybrid chimera that, that stayed put back down there inside of the, down with the lizards uh, in Noah's Ark. Uh, but uh, they're forced into it. You see, th this I think is the realization of why old earth creationists and intelligent designers don't do systematics because there's no motivation for them to do that. They can easily just let the, oh, we accept the millions of years of long ages. Uh, William Jennings Bryan was the same way back in the 1920s, which is uh, why it's kind of fun to see older creationist stuff because you discover there ain't nothing new. <laughs> they, they tweak a few new blips. They'll bring up bacterial flagella because in the post-intelligent design era, they put that up as talking points, but it's still, gee whiz, ain't things complicated. It had to come from somewhere. Therefore, it must be God. QED. We actually have cited a book that I have from 1967. It's a creationist book, which is word for word many of the exact same arguments that you would hear from yeah. any creationist around today. Yeah. In fact, one of the ones that I'm going to be putting on uh, a later evolution hour, uh, there was uh, a guy from Breitbart, uh, the uh, wacky right wing website, and he uh, has ventured into a real news website. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, he made the terrible mistake of stepping onto my evolution turf. Oh, now I can measure you with precision, Buckaroo. And he brought up G.K. Chesterton, who you may not be aware of. Was the name a, sounds familiar. A, a Roman Catholic um, a mystery writer who created the Father Brown mysteries. And in fact, there's a perfectly fine little TV series, Father Brown, although they're all made up stories now. They, they ran out. They're, they're, he died in 1936. Now, he died in 1936. So... What possible relevance can it be to get a, 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 a quotation from Chesterton, a non-biologist, non-scientist, non-paleontologist, before DNA was discovered, before homeobox genes, before promagnathids were discovered, pontificating on missing links in the fossil record? I'm sure he had something extremely relevant to say, and it, you know, he, up to date. Uh, he, he he was very florid, and 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 basically devoid of information. It's just a generic dislike. Now, admittedly, an awful lot of what was going on in evolutionary theory from our perspective is like, oh, oh, you poor children, you didn't know about so much. You're trying to talk about genetics in 1940 and you don't know about retro transposons. I mean, you poor things. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, um, I showed you a project uh, or a couple papers that I cited for a project that were from the early 1900s regarding uh, actinomyces, which is a bacteria, but at the time they thought it was a fungus, which is why they called yeah. it actinomyces. Exactly, and and they, they tried the best they could. Oh, Brian says he likes Father Brown. So do I. The, the show is quite too. It actually has quite a long uh, thing. There were relatively few film versions. I'm going to talk about the historical geek out here. Um, and there was then a TV series that was done in Britain that was based on uh, some of the stories, I think, in the 1970s with, uh, oh God, I can't think of his name right off the bat. Uh, and then this recent iteration, which is the guy that plays uh, Beasley's father uh, from the Harry Potter series. He's the one that plays Father Brown. And they have a wonderful thing that the, the, the fuss potty uh, woman from the uh, uh, church um, is uh, the daughter of uh, um, Cyril Cusack, the fabulous Irish actor. Uh, of, so it, as soon as she opens her mouth and the way she smiles and all like, oh my gosh, of course, you know, that's why. Cindy Cusack, that's, I know who your dad is. Anyway, so there's my geek out on Father Brown Mysteries. And that, and it's a very modern version. They're okay with gay rights. Uh, they're, they're issues with, with modern social issues that probably would have horrified G.K. Chesterton back in the 1930s. But, you know, it's 80 years later. Times have changed. Move on, get used to it. Um, anyway, all of this is leading up to the other half of the thing, which is the Mazinian salinity crisis. Because what we've got here, I bet if any of you know what the hell that is, I, you get points. Because uh, um, I knew just vaguely about aspects of it, but I didn't even know it by that name. I'll put the little thing, in, I'll type that into there. The Mazinian salinity crisis. Do, 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 Mazinian salinity crisis. And this was not because they ran out of salt at the grocery store. Uh, it was a really intriguing thing, and it relates to the whole point of how science evolves based on improving data sets. First, it started out when I think it was the Glomar Challenger uh, in 1970 started dredging around the Mediterranean looking at cores they were bringing up. And they discovered, yipes, there's all these salt evaporites at the bottom of the Mediterranean. 
what the hell is that doing down in the middle? You, you can't generate that in a normal ocean. Weird. And so they quickly discovered, they so well, let's look at some more spots. Uh, evaporites, 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 all over the Mediterranean. And so they began to think by the early 1970s that maybe the whole Mediterranean dried up uh, when uh, the tectonics closed the Strait of Gibraltar and there was an ice age during that period, less water coming in and all that kind of stuff. Now, 1970 is important as a starter date. This is before they understood a lot about plate tectonics. That was in the mid 1970s on. So what happens is that um, a part of the issue was how to explain the evaporites and were they requiring an actual desert or a, a, a shallow sailing lakes or could they be formed underwater under other circumstances? And guess what issue Ord focuses in on the issue about whether or not they could be formed underwater or not. He wants to have it all presumably part of the big slosh. Now the fun part is back in 2005, Ord was still following the traditionalist approach of Henry Moore's where they denied that this thing happened at all. By 2017, he's finally caught up with the data field and he can't flush it all down the toilet. So he's got to maybe try to somehow put it into the big slosh. So he's focusing in on the evaporites, evaporites, evaporites. But the amazing thing is he's missing the whole picture. The reason why it comes up in the book is because our book is because it's in the section on how the Grand Canyon formed and how incised canyons form. And you see, the thing is, is that uh, I've, I've explained this in other things, but it's an easy thing to do. And when you're talking with creationists, it's an easy thing to do when you don't need a power plant. River, water comes in here, flows out here. Relatively little difference. Earthquake occurs, boop, there's a ridge, waterfall. Those are really rare because waterfalls, Playfair's rule back in like 1805 said, why aren't there more waterfalls? Because rivers have had time to erode them. So they're really unusual. There's something where you go, duh. <laughs> so, so waterfalls are immediately a clue that there's been tectonic activities going on. Ah, let's get more subtle. How do you make an incised canyon? Well, what it happens is the difference as there has to be a differential between inlet and outflow that is happening as fast or faster than the river can erode through it. That makes an incised canyon. Now, in the case of the Grand Canyon, it was the Colorado uplift pushing the land up. In the case of the Mycenaean salinity crisis, it was the Mediterranean drying up. Now, prediction. If change in water differential produces incised canyons, what should we expect to find all around the Mediterranean? Inside in canyons. canyons. Yay. And pass. there there are. Fun fact, not all of them are on land. Because some of the rivers, they discovered the, the canyons out in the continental shelf when the water level was lower. <laughs> the and talk about uh, you've heard of the Tethya Sea. There was also the Paratethya Sea, which was kind of what was left over as uh, way before India slams into the new uh, thing. Uh, about uh, um, uh, earlier. And so there was an area where the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea are that was all part of this remnant sea system. It eventually uh, uh, fizzled out, but it was interlocked and connected from the Volga all the way down into the Mediterranean Sea. So you have this stair step of lake systems eventually leading to the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean drops, which pulls the water down from everything connected to it. Guess where there's an incised canyon? Volga River. <laughs> this is just a fabulous detective story. And the, 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 the ingenious one, again, this is why plate tectonics was so interesting. The Po River, which is in northern Italy, and it drains eastward into the Adriatic. Uh, nice flat plain. They get floods there all the time and all that. And they were hunting around, and they couldn't see any sign of there being um, an incised canyon there. So head scratching, head scratching, head scratching. Ooh, they need to pay attention to the geology of it. Turns out you've got all these little fragments of rock forms and the continents are slipping together, the African plate slamming into the uh, European plate. Most of Italy is actually on the African plate. <laughs> and so what's happening is that the section where the Po River is wasn't always at the altitude it is now, which is modern sea level. It was, in fact, way lower and has been pushed up over time to the level we see now. So back when the Mycenaean salinity crisis was, was going on, there was no Po River. Even when the water level of that area was half a mile lower, it was still under, I think, 600 feet of water. <laughs> wow. <coughs> 
So it's just this delicious jigsaw puzzle that they put together. Uh, so I put a bunch of little papers on there. Um, all, I think almost all of which were cited by the 2017 version of Ord's argument. So you get to look at what Ord was talking about, how selectively he was nitpicking these things. And then you can go read the original and see all the stuff he's leaving out. Uh, I don't think I have one directly there on the Nile. None of those were open access. But the Nile is the, the coup de grace. Because it, when they were building, the Soviets were helping uh, Nasser build the Aswan High Dam back in the 1960s. And I didn't really pay much attention to it at the time, but it's more interesting now. Uh, because they had to find bedrock for the damn dam. And they had to go down, 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 because the whole damn thing is a fill-in of sediments. They had to go down 900 feet to find bedrock. And they discovered on either side that they were looking at an ancient incised canyon that was that deep back when the Messinian salinity crisis was on. Farther downstream, uh, it was about a mile deep down where it breached into the Mediterranean Sea. And they've actually found the previous delta deposits of the old Paleo Nile out in the Mediterranean Sea. <laughs> Isn't uh, this neat stuff? That's yeah, pretty it's crazy. It's absolutely astonishing. Yeah, and, and so I, I, I have just been spending like the last week or two in, 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 in fascination land, piecing together all this stuff. Uh, and it was just absolutely delicious. Well, what happened then when the Mediterranean broke up, you had when finally the uh, Atlantic breached that gap where the land had been pushed up and it's where Gibraltar is now. For about a hundred years, you had the most spectacular tourist attraction on earth, the loudest waterfall on the planet, nine miles wide and 3000 feet high, roaring along, refilling in about a hundred years, sucking shrimp in from the Atlantic ocean and a whole bunch of stuff. It was absolutely spectacular. And for a while, because it took, um, it happened so quickly that there was no chance for the, the, the Nile Grand, Little Grand Canyon. You'll remember that from the discussion of the Little Grand Canyon in, uh, with Mount St. Helens. Um, the, um, their Little Grand Canyon, it basically was an estuary 1,200 miles all the way down to Sudan. So there would have been just a long estuary from the Mediterranean Sea up for a relatively short period of time because over the next few million years, the relentless Nile silted, 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 and that built the silts up to the level that we know in pyramid building age. Wow. Yeah, that is how pretty. Can, how, how can creationists compete with that? I mean, <laughs> that happens to be. Yeah, that is absolutely fascinating. That's far more interesting than what I've been reading in Menton. <laughs> well, everything is more interesting than what you'd be reading in Menton. But the thing was, is that I, I stumbled onto all of this um, because I knew about the Mycenaean or the, the Mediterranean dry up. And I thought, well, what, what, what creationists have discussed it? Have they mentioned it much? Ah, Michael Ord. Boop. And so I looked up his things and started tracking down his source material. And so then in the source material he was citing, that's where I started finding out all this new material. One of the papers, I think it was the Riveri, uh, Riveri paper, which I put the link up to, said that the evaporites were not the interesting thing. It was all this tectonic information that actually worked out the, the secrets of what was going on in the Mediterranean Sea. And that was in a paper he cited. So he's just literally tiptoeing over and around all of this information that's literally under his own nose and that he can't account for within his own frame because it doesn't work. Well, why be honest about the data when you can cherry pick it? I mean, come on, yeah, RJ. Yeah. And then the other aspect, of course, the reason why this all came up is because this is the section on the Mount St. Helens Little Grand Canyon where we have the things. I can't eye roll hard enough at that. Yeah. <laughs> and the scab lands and various other things that there are examples of what happens. I, I will be citing material from this guy week who had suggested maybe that the Grand Canyon uh, might have, and you mentioned it in, in your original draft in there, uh, where they thought maybe there might have been a, a lake that had broken up and carved the early stages of the Grand mm -hmm. Canyon. They were at no point were they ever claiming the entire Grand Canyon was formed that way, and yeah. and yet the uh, Whitmore was implying, oh, this is this is pretty much like what we were proposing. Yeah, no. it's yeah, it's like utter bullcrap because they they yeah they all they were saying was this uh, lake spillover hypothesis was only talking about more or less starting the. The cutting out of the Grand Canyon, yep. uh, it very gradually, of course, while the creationists are saying that it basically just 
completely flooded at all at once and caused the Grand Canyon. This is exactly like what we said. As you were aware, it turned out to be wrong. That uh, in 2013, there was a complete reanalysis. First of all, they found out that the Lake Hopi was never deep enough or high enough in the right location to have done that model. So well, it was right. just. And there uh, are no, uh, and, no lake deposits downstream either. Yeah, and so. worse, they found that by that time, the Colorado had breached the Kaibab uh, uh, um, Plateau. So it was a, an unnecessary hypothesis. Oopsie. <laughs> so there, there we go on that. Anyway. The thing was, is that in the course of researching all of this stuff about what lake breaches do, I already we already know about that fabulously with the Scablands, the Lake Missoula stuff up in my neck of the woods. There's also Lake Bonneville that broke in one gigantic gush 17,000 years ago. Just imagine, if you've ever been to Salt Lake, just imagine everything that you can see from Salt Lake out to the mountains all being one gigantic lake. Hmm. Lake Bonneville was big. Lake Salt Lake is just a pissant little thing compared to Lake Bonneville. Anyway, about 17,000 years ago, it breached down the Snake River into the Columbia. And in fact, I know from the lecturers in the scientists here in Spokane uh, that they had a, a, a problem at times sorting things out because the southern section of the Columbia Gorge Missoula flooding is overlapping the stuff that's coming from the Bonneville flooding earlier. So that some of the deposits are actually things not from the north coming down from, from uh, Montana, but from the south coming up from Utah. <laughs> huh. Isn't that fun? Oh, yeah, it's an incredible jigsaw puzzle that they've had to work out on that. And, and I've attended a lot of the lectures and stuff of the presentations that they that there's a bunch of ge geologists around in, in my neck of the woods. And I've been haunting their public lectures uh, to great benefit. Haunting right? like a ghost. Yeah. Huh? Well, we are in October, you know, so we have to do all that kind of stuff. But what, what is so delicious about this is to contrast the big slosh nothing with the evidence directly underneath them. It, I, I uh, will be pointing out how uh, Snelling and Austin and these various others are really, really careful about how they discuss some of these cases. Because if you look at the pictures of real genuine catastrophic flooding when lake breaches occur and you have a sudden rush of water, uh, along a relatively flat surface, it produces a wide trench with vertical walls. It doesn't make an incised canyon. It physically can't, and let alone a canyon that meanders. You just don't get wiggly rivers. You get a straight hole. Even though on Mars, uh, there's an example that some creationists have brought up about a big influx of water that happened billions of years ago, and it produced this thing like 40 miles wide. It's a huge trench. Straight wall, long trench. <laughs> And Nobody's ever going to confuse those things with the Grand Canyon. Do they not uh, have eyes to see? I don't know. So, that's, uh, it's really weird to bring up a, a flood on Mars. Oh, know. they literally try to imply that this was somehow part of the things happening in the Creation Week and early on. Remember, there's a tradition that knocks around in creationism. Um, uh, fasten your seatbelt on this one where uh, um, Phil, uh, Henry Morris seriously was arguing in the early 1970s that the craters of the moon were caused from lightning bolts thrown by Archangel Michael during his battle with Satan. I don't know. I think uh, that's, that's about on par with uh, Nephilim Free's lunar bukkake. <laughs> yeah, well, well, yes. Well, and that and the ballistic koalas <laughs> by volcanoes. I mean, heck, why not just say the volcanoes blasted the koalas into the moon? Might as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. why not? Let's let's go there. Well, you know, a uniformitarian, are you assuming that the moon and the Mars were as far away as they are now? Now, Oh, man. Yeah, and it goes on and on like all this. But anyway, um, the, the wonderful thing that I'm hoping to inspire in everybody is is how deliciously exciting and interesting all of this stuff is. And don't be terrified of reading primary source science work. If, at the very least, if you see something that's especially a general review bit, check to see whether they've got illustrations and other kinds of things, because some of the graphics in these things are going, wow, now I know what the hell's going on. You can see things where they're working out where the plate boundaries are. They're, they're giving descriptions of what the paleo environments were. There, there's a whole bunch of things going on in that kind of stuff. And even if when you start out, you may not uh, be able to grapple with all of the jargon and terminology that's being used. It's a learning process. You think I came out of the box knowing about all of this crap? No. You Somehow gotta, that wouldn't surprise me, though. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, no, I, I'll tell you that the vast majority of what I know in the sciences, I have learned only since about 1995. Hey, I think the same could be said of evolutionary developmental biology. 
So. <laughs> yeah, and, and in many ways, I was glad that I didn't take biology in high school because I would have to unlearn all of the stuff that they were actually not quite getting right based on the books that were based on the stuff from 1960 before I was in school. So yeah, this, this was somewhere where actually I was kind of glad that I started diving into it uh, during the creation science era and in the intelligent design era in the 80s and 90s well, uh, that I started looking into the stuff. Now I'm catching up on the early stages of homeobox genes and I'm eliminating the, the faulty starts you would get if you were drawing on like a biology textbook from 1936. <laughs> well, uh, I'm afraid I'm not so lucky. I'll have to be uh, steeped and seeped in the in the literature for the next several years. Yeah. So. Well, although it is, it is very usual. Again, this is the fact that I come from a history background. So I was learning about uh, historiography, which is the history of history. And there, is, there are whole journals devoted to the history of science where they will go into the little ins and outs and ups and downs. Ooh, one of the, I think I made a link to you on it, uh, in fact, uh, was a very brief one that indicates there's really good evidence that Gregor Mendel was not an anti-Darwinist. Oh, uh, yeah, um, that even he like wrote some of Darwin's notes in his own um, Yeah, he had his own personal journals. copy. Darwin may not yeah. have known about Mendel, but Mendel knew about Darwin. And he yeah. was, and that they found indications as he was revising his own work that he was incorporating Darwinian concepts in his uh, later writings. I wonder if, if uh, not Mendel, uh, Linnaeus would have been an evolutionist had he lived. Yeah, it's that's fascinating. The 1500s. To find out. Yeah, that that uh, because they, they would have so many different. Well, they were, again, with this G.K. Chesterton example, uh, if Chesterton knew now what we know. Uh, that if he were asked in 1936 to get caught up to speed on the next 90 years of science, uh, well, what would his view stay the same? Well, I mean, or temperamentally, you could say the same of any creationist. Get up to speed on modern phylogenetics, and they go, uh, no. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and, that, and, that, and that's why you have the thing is um, uh, put out your model. Uh, I don't have any problem with a creationist presenting a viewpoint. Find it dandy. Present your model. Explain the data. And of course, I'll within about five seconds, I'll be on to therapsids and wanting to know, uh, okay, what's your explanation? For How that? many ALUs are there? How did they get there? Yeah. Bingo. Yeah. And so there are a few little things that <laughs> I think the I data know you. are there. I think I know I think we, we should type talk to each other once or twice, something like that. Yes, we are on tweets. Yeah, we get to see what's going on here. Because on what you want is uh, uh, there there are things that I have that are litmus tests which are things which I, uh, and everybody can do their own litmus tests. What you want to do is to have things that you know and love, that you're really knowledgeable on at more than a superficial level, and you know the background of it. So if anybody steps on that turf, they don't know where the minefields are, but you do. And you're just waiting. Come over here. Come go a little closer. One more step. Ooh, now here's the question I want to ask you. And you know exactly what to target. And so I've had this way back when I first started out uh, the Troubles in Paradise project um, on things like on the Great Pyramids. If anybody tells you that somebody other than the Egyptians built the Great Pyramids, that's a litmus test stupid. No, nope, sorry, we, we know that quite clearly. Uh, if they think uh, Atlantis, or rather Lemuria and Mu uh, were real, or you find the same things with flat earthers, there are all sorts of issues where it's so cockamamie wrong, or they think Dr. Dino is a scientist, any of those things. Or is a doctor. So ludicrous. Yeah, or is even a doctor that are so ludicrously wrong that you now have a measurement empirically of just how far up their ass their head is stuck. And you can do it in any particular area. Of, of You've got people who have geology expertise, so they're going to be going into the rocks and things way more level than, uh, than you and I would be able to go to. I would, have a, I would have to really bone up to study as to if you thrust a rock underneath my nose, what kind of thing is it is. Whereas a geologist is going to say, oh, well, that's a feldspar with a little bit of and they can go, you know, uh, rattle it off. And the same thing with the biology angle, uh, the systematics angle, paleontology, uh, astrophysics, uh, but also because if you're dealing with the young earth creationists, they're stumbling into history too. They don't know it yet. <laughs> because so few of them study the matter. They're just finally wising up. And this has been literally taking decades to happen. I have been just sitting back waiting for the shit to hit fan on creationists realizing they have to move Egypt, all of it. 
the entire Egyptian chronology has to come down post flood. They cannot tolerate anything in the Egyptian sequence in there because it's a contiguous society. They can't have a, a discontinuity that they're not noticing. Well, uh, 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 Hot Holler 54 did a fantastic video years ago on how Anthropogenesis fails at trying to move the uh, Egypt down past the flood because they can't account for the uh, the population growth and you know, oh, all there's a, yeah, there's a yeah. bunch of things they have to deal with. Plus their inscriptions, their language, their historical uh, religions, all the different things they have. There's a continuity to Egypt that is so mammoth that it's no coincidence that the people who try to do this moving trick don't know anything about Egyptology. <laughs> They're not or biology or geology or paleontology or astrophysics. Exactly or <laughs> So that, I think, is another take-home point is if somebody with a PhD in their name starts pontificating on subject X, is their discipline the same discipline X? If not, alarm bells should be going off. You're not in that field, you're an interloper. And we know that people with foods are perfectly capable of, of suffering from cranial blockage of the rectum, just like anybody else does when they have an ideology that they're pushing. Oh yeah, look at, um, you know, as a recent example, look at Jordan Peterson who talks about uh, neurobiology uh, you know, and, and uh, he talks about like evolution and some neurobiology and stuff. He's a, I mean, he's a psychologist, which is still not either of those fields. And he makes pronouncements yeah. about both, which are just laughably wrong. So, yeah. well, and, and neuroscience is a particular area where it's one of those columns. I have a, I, in my master work, uh, uh, and if you agree with my work, support me, become a Patreon, a gift to go fund me, buy my damn books. Uh, uh, any of those different ways or all of the above. But the thing is, is that in my bit of research then, I there's a whole column for neuroscience. And there's the column where anti-evolutionists have cited that work in some context, or the column that is the stuff they haven't cited that I've not spotted any example of. Guess which column is way longer? It's the stuff they the haven't cited. one that's not cited by yeah. the anti-evolutionists. <laughs> That you're barely running into a five or ten percent, and it's very superficial material. This is true across these issues. I, I'm breaking it down by origins of life issues, geology, astrophysics, cosmology, uh, paleontology, human evolution, neuroscience, uh, general biology, and in every single instance, the the field of the sometimes it's just astonishingly small. The same articles get lopped in over and over and over again. And I go, so there's another creationist and they've cited a technical paper and I look and it's got a little black box next to it. It's already been cited by an anti-evolutionist. Oh, come on. Can't you come do better than that? <laughs> well, RJ, you know, there, there are only like five papers total in every sub, every field of, of, you know, science. So, I mean, oh, there's I such a small, true. there's just such I a small area true. to, to search. Like I would like to say at the moment, my reference bibliography is involving a bit over 26,000 technical papers. And then I've got another about just under 10,000 general science works in my reference bibliography. So there, if you think that a 400 source creationist book is giving you nosebleeds on the source citation front, just try grappling with tens of thousands of material. I've got 9,000 anti-evolution postings. In my in my reference base, I mean, I'm, uh, yeesh, I'm yeah. way ahead of everybody on this stuff. You know, neuroscience is an interesting subject. It it would be really interesting, you know, perhaps to write about some other time. Oh perhaps. yes, yes. There there will be many venues, I think, in future in relation to where we will be able to explore that in such delightful little aspects. There, this it will be fun. interesting, certainly, or at least yeah, it, it might be. You know, yeah. The, uh, uh, whereas Evolution Slam Dunk was a relatively focused work just on the paleontology aspect, although I did try to touch upon as many of the wackaloons orbiting the issues so that if you don't know diddly squat about the creation evolution debate, you'll get the major players and the major issues going on just by reading Evolution Slam Dunk. It's going to be way more detailed when we get to the rocks we're there. And so thank you, Vesta. He says, you're, they're, they're, my books are on uh, your Christmas wish list. Hopefully... By then, maybe we will also have two more books out. I'm still plugging away on the uh, the second Paralogues novel, and we, of course, are both plowing away on the rocks. We're there, and uh, it's it's a, a 
it's an absolute delight to work with because it, in every bloody chapter, I find new things I didn't know before. And like this Messinian salinity crisis, there are areas where I'm filling in, catching up on the science material that's cutting edge. And in every case, it's so much more interesting than that little ball of fluff that exists over in the anti-evolution world. There, there's is a, a not only a cartoon, but it's not even an interesting one. Yeah, and and especially when it's repeated by David Mint. <laughs> oh, lordy be, yeah. Minton is an intriguing thing. If you're not familiar with him, uh, you must not have read Mint's creationism stuff. And if you have read a lot of his stuff, my condolences. I almost uh, cried when I realized that I had to read two of his chapters in a row. Yeah. He's, he's an old standard in there. Uh, he comes from a medical profession background. He's got a bit of science training and so forth. So there's no excuse for what he does with the data field. But an awful lot of his stuff is very old apologetics from the 1980s and 90s that he wrote apparently in a creationist friendly newspaper in St. Paul, I think. Uh, that A lot of those, if you look at his postings that are at Answers in Genesis today, Look at the date you go previously put at the uh, St. Des Moines Register in 1984, you know, huh. that they're not recent material. But he does do recent material, and he hasn't improved with age. <laughs> no, he hasn't. He's, he's it's like backwards cheese, I don't know. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, yeah. Just, it just gets worse. I mean, he's... It's like as he ages, the technical material he cites ages too. So. It's it's deterior. It's like the picture of Dorian Gray. You know, it's just yeah. <laughs> it's just really un unpleasant. Except the the other part doesn't. And and Menton is one of their point people in some of these areas. That uh, you've got a, a relatively small handful. Remember, there's only another thing I measure in my tip work. Uh, there's only about 80 fat claimants currently operating in all of anti-evolutionism, and about three quarters of those are young Earth creationists. So they are, from the arguer point of view, way more significant. I mean, poor Aaron Rod debating with Fazal Rana. No offense, Faz, but old Earth creationism is irrelevant in 21st century anti-evolutionism. It's either intelligent design or the big elephant in the room, young Earth creationism. That the vast majority of websites, the vast majority of postings, the vast majority of activists are young Earth creationists. You don't always know this, though until you start asking methods questions. So one thing that anybody who's been following me on Twitter, and if you do not follow me on Twitter, if you are on Twitter, uh, at RJ Downard, um, uh, put me on your thing and you will get the feeds and you may either marvel at them or not as the case may be. But the thing is, is that the if you have somebody making certain generic anti-evolution claims, do not assume they are a young earth creationist. Do not necessarily assume they're even religious, although don't be gobsmacked when you find out that they are. Yeah. You can find this out just by checking off in their little uh, info put. You will, but, but demographically, the odds are, if somebody is an anti-evolutionist, they're a Coulter camp, conservative, creationist, religious. And that has been the dynamic for the last 150 years. There are relatively few exceptions to that rule. And they will usually involve slight modifications, like William Jennings Bryan was a progressive liberal culture camp, anti-evolutionist, religious um, uh, kinds of thing. But the vast majority of them today and historically have been of that mode. But there is a divide between that intelligent design frame and the old earth creationist frame, where they accept the geologic system, they accept the Big Bang, all of that stuff, it's all part of design uh, the, of the great uh, God's uh, providential plan. So don't assume, ooh, yes, uh, that, don't assume that they hold to those young Earth creationist positions. That's why you want to get them on a map of time issue. And there's another buzzword oh. trope, the yeah. map of time. In my case, is, it was kind of backwards. Uh, when I talked to that uh, long story short guy, and I thought he was an intelligent designer because he really likes Meyer, but then he didn't know if all species within the same genus were related to each other. And I was oh, like, well, what? That, 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 that's, not, that's not mutually exclusive with intelligent design because most intelligent designers don't think about that either. I was just kind of like, what? Yeah, and, and that's, you see, from my perspective, since that, in fact, the fact that he's so vague on those is actually more characteristic of the old earth creationist intelligent designer than it is mm. of the young earth creationist who just suddenly started prattling, oh, well, they're this so-called kind. And if they managed 
to have been in that rarefied group that has actually read Todd Wood and Kavanaugh all the best, then, then they might actually be able to spew baromenology stuff, in which case you can up the ante and go, oh, okay, let's talk about monobaromen, shall we? Oh, my and, gosh. Uh, I, would, <laughs> yeah, you I would love, I have never gotten into a discussion, debate with a creationist over the technicalities of baromenology. Nothing would make my year more than to be able to do that. I would love to to speak some systematics with a creationist. Yeah. And this is a revealing point. Again, there's an advantage to looking at, I have more people in my listing of internet anti-evolutionists and political ideologues and occasional flat earthers and all of that in a long column that is way longer than the listing of the people that I have in my regular postings for anti-evolutionism. It's about 2,400 on that. And I think it's way over 5,000 in my uh, internet listing. And the odds are that you're gonna find people in the internet who are like Kent Hovind after the lobotomy, which is pretty frightening because these are people who haven't read a damn thing. They don't know diddly squat about anything. They've got a few little buzzwords that they throw at you and they will flail around if you bring up certain issues, they'll hunt around to see if they can find a creation, a source that will reinforce what they want to be true. And if you know the literature well enough, oh, it's like shooting ducks in a barrel. I mean, this is just absolutely amazing because they're, they're, they, you, they don't realize that you can know more than they do. And so you can tailor your questions and structures in a way that forces them to just go yaggedy yaggedy yaggedy. I mean, yaggedy, yaggedy. for God's sakes, when we talked to Nephilim Free, he didn't know what a carbohydrate was. You no. think if he's if he feels he's in a position to talk about evolution and biochemistry and all this other stuff, and he doesn't know what a carbohydrate is, uh -uh. Yeah. you're Old not Scratch on the level. He, he did like ancient aliens, though. That was comedy gold. I I regard that as as uh, historical pornography. Oh my God, I get I. I talk to people, or I've I've listened to people in reality talk about ancient aliens, and it's and it it is painful to to listen to because it's mm. as I've said before, it's it's almost a form of racism because everyone is like, oh no, they yeah. could this these poor benighted people couldn't build this structure. It's Another too plug for my work: uh, the Dynamania chapter uh, at in various points goes into the cross fertilization that you get with that ancient astronaut, cryptozoology, young earth creationists, super civilizations, Atlanteans, there's a, a David Childress, there's a few of people that pop up in that ancient astronaut environment that also leak over into creationism. And this has been going on for like decades. I, I discussed the um, now very old, good God, I think it's probably older, older than you are, 1982, I think. Uh, older so than me is not very hard to do, RJ. That's true. Well, that just shows you what an old fart is. You know, for me, 1982 was just like yesterday. Yeah, there we go. I'm like, God, I wasn't, 30 years ago. I wasn't quite there yet. Yeah. Anyway, the um, uh, Charlton Heston hosted this thing about, I think it's called The Amazing Origins of Man or something like that. And it's just this train wreck of young earth creationism and snippets of David Childress and cryptozoology stuff. And it's just a, a, a just gobsmackingly bad it was on cbs i remember i watched it in the ancient days live it may very well be on youtube somewhere anyway i discussed a lot of that stuff and to this day you still find that crossover look at uh standing for truth sucking up all of those lore about dinosaurs still being alive and the stuff that he got secondarily from nance's book and never fact check are we getting a pattern here oh yeah the yeah vance nelson we are, we bumped into him in the um in the video, uh, when we fact-checked the guy uh, who talked about did humans live with dinosaurs, uh, BS. That was, a, that was mm. a, his, his beyond, name. The aptly named BS. Yeah, Beyond Science. We did a video on him, and Vance Nelson owns apparently the only, uh, what is, it's like a jade triceratops, or not triceratops, uh, Montanaceratops, allegedly. But if you look at it, it doesn't look like a Montana Ceratops. It's not even, it, it wasn't even Jade. It was turquoise, actually. Uh, yeah. But it was, he owns the only one. And it's supposed to be evidence that the ancient Chinese uh, made artwork about Montana Ceratops, which by the name is not from China. It's so. from Montana, yeah. <laughs> it's actually very interesting. I mentioned it in Dynamania, not in relation to a Jade figurine, but the fact that it's one of those with just the early stages of the little horns 
that are popping up on the nasal horns. If you look at, if you look at, a, 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 if you've ever seen protoceratopsids, uh, they look like triceratops baby. And they have relatively tiny neck frills. They have the very distinctive parrot-like predentary bone, which uh, shows up initially in the cetacosaurids, which are an Asiatic group. Sorry for geeking out here. You have the Asiatic cetacosaurids, which then turn into the very early protoceratopsids in Asia, not Montana ceratops, then spread across the now linked Asia and the North America, where the, Mon where the protoceratopsids start kind of proliferating. And that's the stuff that turns into the triceratops types, all those large ceratopsians, because they basically have a new niche available. There is still, I think there's one taxa of ceratopsid that appears to have gone the other direction, that their range spread back into Asia a bit. But basically, for all practical purposes, ceratopsids are only known in North America. And because there was the Neobara Seaway that extended out back when Kansas was beachfront property, okay. that basically you don't have any, I don't know of any ceratopsid in eastern North America because there was a body of water in between. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. It's it's real, the Eastern United States is very strange because there are actually uh, Tyrannosaurus specimens known from the Eastern United States, which is a little weird. Uh, like uh, Appalachiosaurus, I think is down in Florida, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, and course, by then you're yeah. now into the very late Cretaceous. At that time, the, the, the Neobar Seaway is starting to fill in. So you do have routes as you go farther out. Look, look at uh, um, uh, the Glen Rose, Texas thing. Uh, that's, well, that was uh, early middle Cretaceous, Cretaceous. Middle Cretaceous. Or middle Cretaceous. So, right. you, so it, th that area is starting to fill in to where you can start having interfaunal exchanges. But it's probable the reason why you don't find ceratopsids outside of their range is because they're becoming very specialized with their diet. They have these cheese grater, very complex teeth structures that are designed to eat very tough plants. And if the plants don't range into other areas, they don't go with them. Mm -hmm. So there's the thing, this whole paleogeography issue, which of course you will expect the creationists not to ever offer in, in what was going on supposedly during the flood, post-flood period. Floating island or floating, you know, forests. And that, that's about as close for anyone. And the floating forests, the creationists think there were whole floating forests yeah, which not little mats of vegetation. We're talking big forests, the yeah. kind of things you would put in a bad science fiction movie. Not this a, is not quite as yeah. bad as floating islands in Avatar, uh, but nevertheless, it's getting damn close. Uh, the idiot says, never heard of Montana Ceratops, though. Nerd veracity isn't what it used to be. Uh, don't be su uh, surprised on all of this. I mean, there's an awful lot of taxa um, that have appeared in just the last 20 years. Yeah. And in particular, in relation to dinosaurs, holy moly, you got to keep up because the new taxes that are being derived all the time is um, just astonishing. Wikipedia actually is a great source. They yeah. do a year-by-year -year, uh, discoveries in paleontology. So yeah. you can keep track, literally, of every year, and I used it, or we used it, for uh, one of my videos where we did, um, yeah. it was titled An Evolving Understanding, where we talked about what fossils were known in Darwin's time, uh, before and after he wrote Origin of Species. Yeah. And so... Yeah, it tracks it year by year, so you can just yeah, go I through. No, I have no complaints mm -hmm. about Wikipedia. Wikipedia is not a destination. It's a, a, a doorway because mm -hmm. people are putting up the primary source information. Sometimes you'll find taxa, and there's no references to what source that it's in. Ooh, that's a new one. That's mm -hmm. something that's just barely hit. So you can you can use a lot of mechanisms to try to measure stuff. Oh, go ahead. Which reminds me, uh, a, new t a new phylum of invertebrate was discovered uh, in the past month. Uh, it was ca uh, They're called... Um, not moss piglets. It had another name because moss piglets are tardigrades. Um, a, li a living one or a fossil? no? It's extinct. It was in um, it was in amber. Uh, micro Ooh, That means pretty damn recent. Yeah, so it's like 40, 40 million years ago. Yeah, um, uh, and so there you will have a thing where there's a whole new phylum of life which has only one sample found in amber. <laughs> uh, a new microinvertebrate with features of mites and tardigrades in Dominican amber. Uh, this. Uh, that's right. You see, the designer wasn't satisfied with merely mites and tardigrades. He wanted to have one that is sort of like both. Right. You got yeah. to keep your. It's like it's like God has like a trading card set. You know, I I, I got to have more finback vertebrates. Okay, let's do some of those there. Okay, there we go. Ooh, predentary bones. Hey, hey, I want to do some predentary bones. Yeah, it's um, it's so new. I can't even get the PDF of it anywhere. It's that new. Mm. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, so. uh, Sinithia uh, vicious. Are we using new techniques to locate fossils? Is this why we're discovering so much? Is it because we know where to look from experience? All of the above. 
um, uh, the, uh, uh, I don't think there's any remote sensing techniques. Uh, that's way more useful in archaeology. Holy moly, that's cutting edge for archaeology. Sort of. But, uh, well, you can see lost cities and all this kind of stuff easily with, with that kind of thing. But uh, uh, paleontology, no. Basically, it's did somebody stumble across a bone and they called somebody and told somebody about it and they go, oh, that's interesting. And then the nearest paleontologist at the nearest university starts looking into it and or some kid who loves paleontology will occasionally dig the whole bloody thing up themselves and, and uh, they go, wow, a great discovery. So yes, there's a lot of things. There's mainly there's more people involved in it. They have more accessibility to the technical literature available. They have more needs of communication where you wouldn't have to write a damn a letter to the paleontologist at some university, you could email them or, or uh, social media them. So it's it, the, the whole process of information flow is accelerated. And I want everybody that's in my network and every other network that I do um, to make use of all of that stuff. One of the reasons why I'm on Twitter is not merely to act like an arrogant bastard prick, but also to deal with all of the fascinating scientists who are on Twitter. And they will put heads up of the latest technical work in their fields. Well, thank you. <laughs> that speeds up the process because there are thousands of technical journals that I've tracked over the years. And it's impossible to keep up with every single one of those bloody issues. There's just way too much data field. Even Googling, you can become overwhelmed with a layer on layer on layer of citations. Oh, stuff. absolutely. So, yeah, so by having people saying, ooh, this is important, they're putting an immediate arrows pointing in because if, if, if just as you don't ask a violinist to tell you what great bricklaying is, you don't ask a bricklayer to tell you what a great violinist is. So if you want to know who's doing the cutting edge work in biology and genetics, well, follow some biologists, <laughs> some geneticists. They'll, they'll, they'll fill you in. Oh man, I'm trying to find what the name of, cause it was a, it was in a tweet that well, I, I got saw. You annoyed now. You got to figure, I mean, it's the same way when I'm trying to remember something, I go, where did I see that? Where did I see that? They I'm called it, because they, they gave the name of it because I can't get the PDF yet and it makes me very mad. It must mad. not be very big to fit in amber because there's a limit uh, to the size of amber deposit. Yeah. Probably, what, the size of a cockroach or bigger? Oh, uh, it's... if Yeah, it's probably pretty small. It's... Uh, if they're talking about it's near mite size, so you're talking really tiny. Yeah, it's a mighty mite. Yeah, little, little, little bitty, but it's, it's pretty fascinating because, yeah, uh, as RJ said, you know, someone stumbles across... They can use, uh, I believe geologists can use, uh, like, systems for determining where particular age layers are, but you're right, yeah. it's predominantly it's... Oh, they're, they're great. well, they're also computerizing uh, the uh, stratigraphy from one right. region to another. There's, there's a whole sub-discipline of geology of correlating the rocks over there with the rocks over here, and are they the right. same date as the rocks over there, and why? And then you have to put those into data fields and, and try to make sense out of all that to speed up the process. Because as uh, the Tiktaalik case is the most classic example, that if you're going to try to find the ancestors for land vertebrates, you've got to look in shallow water Devonian deposit. So where are shallow water Devonian deposits? Well, sorry, they're not a dime a dozen. Up in and, North you know, Canada. There are little snippets here, little snippets there. They've already mined those out. Oh, there's some up in Northern Canada. Yay, we get to go to northern Canada, out in the middle of nowhere, and fend off bears to do our, our paleontology. Yeah, it's, um, so yeah, you can, uh, well, in a lot of cases, it's, um, you know, uh, it's, as uh, someone accidentally stumbles over uh, a fossil, like I think, was it Mistaken Point, which is one of the Ediacaran uh, fauna sites, was found yeah. because a, a kid like accidentally discovered. I will say you know, this, something. and anybody can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but my take is almost all the great deposits of the world were found by amateurs. Yeah, probably. And then eventually, people start looking into them. And then in other cases, I think one of the one, Maison Creek or something or other, it was in old coal areas, and the coal companies have filled them in so they're not available anymore. <laughs> <laughs> of course they did. It's really, really annoying <laughs> on that. Um, Oh, and on the other side of the fence, uh, I think the, the Native American creationist, um, oh gosh, uh, Lin, Vinnie DeLoria, uh, he made one, one of the arguably stupidest statements that I've ever heard. How come all of these bones they're finding are on the surface? 
Well, I don't think he understands because what erosion where is. where you find them. Uh, I suppose I, you could esca- excavate the entire planet and you would find lots more fossils. But it's not easy to do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's also, it's, it's not, not only not easy, it's not cheap. Because, I mean, you dig a hole, well, there's nothing over here. Let's try over there. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the same thing with archaeology. Uh, where an awful lot of archaeology is done because somebody is trying to build a foundation for a building and they're digging down and suddenly they're finding some Roman thing and they're going, uh-oh, we got to stop. Uh, I'll even do a uh, a plug for uh, Quatermass in the Pit, which is one of my favorite science fiction stories, which involves exactly that sort of a thing where they're in a subway excavation and they encounter things that are more to do. And that's a delicious little tale. Uh, anyway, we have, so I've been pointing out this RJ is on a roll. This could be of record length. We actually are 16 minutes past the hour. That's a little over an hour because we had our stumbling block getting started to begin with. We had creationists in the wires. On that. But anyway, um, <clears throat> The, the, the take home points is that we've got a wonderful mass of information available and everybody can get involved in it, that everybody can get on the source methods thing. And it's a thing you can hone like any skill by doing it. And then in the course of that, uh, don't forget to get my books and help out at Patreon and GoFundMe and all of that, because that's how I keep going at this. And uh, bloody hell, I'm going to keep going as long as I can. It, it can be exhausting work and, and challenging, but it's also damn fun. And for a retiree, I'm having, I'm, I'm doing something that I think is terribly important and that I'm not bad at. And I think it's kind of a, a good thing to do because there's so much woo out there that um, it, all the non-wooists have to work hard to make sure that the wooists don't get things going. And the same point about getting more and more people involved in source methods at all possible levels. Reporters should use source methods analysis when you're at, on po- political matters that somebody can make a political talking point, well, where are you getting information from? And if they can't answer those questions, that should be putting up red flags that maybe you need a cartoon alert. Oh, I think that pretty well does it. I don't think there's any further questions. Uh, Brian Stevens says the one in Casper, Wyoming was found by kids. Uh, Let's see. And um, uh, Vesta Frey, a little known fact, paleontologists are becoming a favorite snack food of polar beers. Okay. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I actually met a paleontologist who, um, oh, they're not in, uh, was in Antarctica, but it made me think about it. Uh, uh, Dr. Julia Clark, who's a paleontologist, fascinating woman, check her out. Um, yeah. She does research in Antarctica. She uh, discovered a or the oldest bird with a syrinx, which is this... Uh, oh, yeah, the, the voice box thing. Yeah, yeah, and it was discovered on Vega Island, uh, Vegavis was what they named it, right, which is right off the coast of Antarctica. And so she does research right at the, the KT boundary, or did. Uh, yeah, it's a really Antarctica. awkward, as you might gather, it's not the most pleasant place to work. But remember oh. that back when the geologically interesting stuff is happening, it was still where it is now, but South America was connected to it, and Australia was connected to it over on the other side. So you had faunal interchanges. This was way before you get koala bears. And you have these wonderful interchanges of fauna in this area that they predicted correctly the kinds of plants and animals you would expect to find in Antarctica based on what you know is in existence in Australia and what you have in South America. That is that applied evolutionary science stuff. I have never seen a creationist work out what they think the flood map was, let alone what was living where and what exactly was on the floating forests and all the other things. Somehow they skipped that stage. Yeah. Yeah, it's... um uh, researchers predicted that either marsup because the ancestors of modern marsupials started in South America, so they and now they're obviously in Australia, so they either went to Australia through Africa, uh, which had branched off at the time by that point, or they had gone through Antarctica. What do they find in Antarctica? Marsupials, huh? How about that? So isn't it? Yeah. So the, the, the biogeography, even though it's a difficult place to work at, uh, going back even farther, um, when you find the, the, my favorite story of geological moving is where uh, India has traveled over there. But anyway, uh, a PD lens is the Mediterranean growing up was uh, stupid. Interesting. Well, I, I hope it was stupendously interesting, too. And so we'll 